I'm Paul Fotenauer, and welcome to Frontiers, where we showcase UC Davis research that helps us understand and live in a changing world. Today we'll talk to two historians from UC Davis who say their job is to help us to remember and draw connections between humans and the environment. Louis Warren is a nationally recognized historian. He is the editor of a textbook called American Environmental History, read by college students across the country. For the next big project, he is writing the environmental history of the American West. Joining him is UC Davis historian Ari Kelman, who wrote the book A River and Its City, The Nature of Landscape in New Orleans. That 2003 book put him on the top of journalist source lists throughout the world because of how well he explained why the city wasn't prepared for Hurricane Katrina. Their field of study is called environmental history. It's an eye-opening new way to examine controversies in politics in America. The United States has had a long history of humans attempting to shape nature for their purposes, whether it was hunting buffalo in the 19th century to meet the demand from eastern consumers, or the centuries-long changes in the Mississippi River Delta to accommodate New Orleans. Unfortunately, we have often seen disastrous results. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Kelman, the first question I want to ask you has to do with New Orleans. And people have really caused the disaster to occur in New Orleans. Why do you say that environmental history is important when we look at that tragedy? That's a good question. Hurricane Katrina is almost like a case study for environmental history in many ways. Uh, New Orleans, the, the site that the city occupies, was a disaster waiting to happen before white settlers even arrived there. And then uh, French colonists made it a lot worse. Uh, eventually it became an American possession. Uh, people drained the swamps surrounding the city. They built up the levees to try and keep floodwaters out. Uh, as the city moved onto lower and lower ground, the, the threat of catastrophic flooding only became much worse. Uh, and what we saw about a year ago was the, the very, very unfortunate consequence of really lousy urban planning, uh, trying to control an environment that's, that's impossible to even really understand in any meaningful way, much less actually control. Uh, Professor Warren, is it lousy urban planning that is causing so many people to look to California and say the same thing's going to happen in the Central Valley with regards to flooding because of the Delta levee system? Well, there's certainly uncomfortable parallels there. The estimates that you read are there are over a thousand miles of levee between the foothills and the Golden Gate, and that the Central Valley being is the most productive agricultural landscape in the world. It's also increasingly, as we see in Sacramento, a place where people live. And I think what's so easy to, for people to forget when they move into a landscape like Sacramento and the Sacramento Valley or the San Joaquin Valley is how much work has gone into creating that landscape, how much construction work in terms of levees, some of which date back to the gold rush era, uh, and canals, dams, reservoirs, the whole complex. And the tendency is to look at this and say, well, you know, this is, this is what nature gave us and we're just making the most of it. And that, I think, is when people stop to think, that they stop thinking in terms of history. They stop thinking about how that landscape has been made, and they cease to take responsibility for maintaining it. And when you do that, you are letting yourself in for, uh, to say the least, problems. And I think this is some of what happened in, with Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. I would think that politicians need to pay attention to environmental historians. Mm -hmm. Are they? Oh. Not enough. <laughs> Not nearly enough. Yeah, we, um, we don't get nearly enough attention. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that too often uh, historians are, I mean, when, when politicians read history, what they're, what they're looking for, obviously, are messages they can take to the public. And I think in those terms, uh, they're often looking for messages they can convey in sound bites. And it's very difficult to explain what went wrong in New Orleans, I think, in a soundbite. This is why Ari wrote a whole book, a tremendous book, on, on, her, on the environmental history of New Orleans. And that's the kind of thing it takes. But um, I, I certainly think that, that uh, everyone can learn a lot about policy and, and get policy ideas from reading environmental history. I, I would just add to that that uh, I think that's entirely true, but I, I, I think that there's uh, a dimension of this that's the fault of scholars, and that I think that, as Louis says, uh, 
politicians are looking for sound bites. They're looking for something that they can convey rather easily to the public in a sound bite. I think that there's a significant portion of the public that's not all that interested in sound bites, but wants to be reading things that they can at least understand. Uh, and I, I, I know that in Louis's most recent work, and I know that in work that I've tried to do, uh, we do our best to make connections with the public, but it's it's, it's not necessarily a real priority a lot of the time for scholars. Environmental historians, I, I think, have tried to have tried at least in, in many cases to, to make those connections because environmental history emerges uh, in, its, in its modern iteration out of the environmental movement, uh, out of a broad-based uh, uh, grassroots movement. Have California politicians come to you? No, I've had I've had politicians from Louisiana who have made contact with me and who've asked me to be a part of a couple of different task forces, but no one from California. Uh, I, I I suspect that uh, the reason for that is that. Again, I think Louis alluded to this. There's there's a lot of parallels between the two cases, but there are also extraordinary differences. Mm -hmm. uh, the the case of, of New Orleans is in many ways uh, a unique one, which isn't to say that there isn't grave danger for the Central Valley or that this isn't the next great flooding disaster uh, that we can wait for. But there are there are some really significant differences. If politicians came to either one of you and said, mm -hmm. "What would you recommend we do?" What would you say? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, <laughs> uh, that, that's the first thing I'd say. Um, I, you know, the one, I, one of the things that, that I think you have to do when you're assessing what kind of policy needs to be made from history uh, is there are, whole, there are a lot of people who know a great deal more about the levees in, in the Sacramento area than I do, obviously. Um, but some kind of way of keeping track of, of levees and, and dating uh, their origins and so forth, because some of these, as I mentioned, are, are very old levees. Um, but I guess, I guess more than that, I, I think the, the thing that I would advise any, anybody who's a, a political uh, leader to do is to try to assess how things got the way they are um, looking beyond, as Ari's talking about, looking beyond sound bites. Um, and to, this is the way environmental historians look at the world, is saying, how have relations between people and nature changed so that they got to this point? And what do you do? What is that story when you figure out what the story is? What does that tell you about what you should be doing differently? And it's rather a way of looking at the world that, that's important here rather than just a, a policy prescription. Do you agree with that? Uh, I do. I mean, I, 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 I could offer some policy prescriptions. I mean, certainly I have policy prescriptions for Louisiana. Uh, but I think that for the, for the Sacramento area, the most significant thing that I think probably Louie and I would agree on is that people have to take a very, very serious look at the consequences of growth. Uh, that this is a, a fa very fragile ecosystem, uh, and in many ways it's a hazardous ecosystem. And the way in which we, we build currently, I don't think takes those issues into account. I think we're still seeing explosive growth and, and what people would call suburban sprawl. We're building in floodplains. Uh, and and as, again, as Louis points out, people don't really even have a sense of, of when some of these levees date from, uh, whether or not the repair, the upkeep uh, is up to date. And so there's a kind of construction, that it's almost a willful disregard for environmental limits, which has been a hallmark of, of development throughout American history. Now, environmental historians also look at, at emerging diseases like West Nile fever and avian flu. And what role do humans play in the movement of these new diseases? Well, people moving um, and often animals moving bring new d diseases to new places. Um, I mean, that's, that's typically how historians would describe the beginnings of epidemics, is the emergence of some new nexus of people, animals, and pathogens or disease-causing organisms. Um, and I think that, that it's a good, a good connection to the conversation we've just been having, because when I look at things like levees um, and how people should be thinking about levees, and I, this will go back to what Ari was just talking about as well, that I think one of the things that we can all do, and, and our political leaders as well, is to start talking in terms of the kinds of, of maintenance you have to do in a given 
nature in a given setting, in a given place, to make it keep working. And with uh, a great example of, of how this works in environmental history is with childhood vaccinations uh, or childhood immunizations. We, we accept this as an everyday thing now, that children, when they go into school, they get immunized and, and that's what happens. Um, and a lot of people look at that and they say, well, what are they being immunized against? You know, chicken pox and, and all these other things? Well, you know, we, we don't have those things anymore, do we? And we don't, the kids don't need that stuff. Uh, and they want to stop paying for it. Um, or classically, people who feel like they've, done, they've paid their due, they want to stop paying for other people's children to be inoculated. So the lesson of history is? The lesson of history is that's disastrous. Um, what it's, it's, childhood immunizations are very much like levies in this sense. It's a kind of devil's bargain you make. You can stave off the natural disaster of the illness or the flood with a shot or with a levy. But you can't just go back to the days of, of ignoring those things without, of, of ignoring the barriers you've put up between yourself and this malady or this flood uh, without, without bringing on down disaster. And I, I think that is the thing, that is one of the fundamental insights of environmental history that, that I'm always encouraging my students to think about. This time I've got a soundbite for you, and that's just that where you've got commercial exchanges, you're going to have ecological exchanges. Exactly. Uh, and that's, uh, uh, at this point, an ancient insight. Uh, mm -hmm. These epidemics, the notion of a transnational epidemic like avian flu, uh, it, it, it's nothing new. Uh, that as we've traded with other nations, we've always brought uh, pathogens from other places to the United States, where oftentimes, particularly in an urban setting or an urbanized setting, they'll, they'll just run roughshod, uh, so-called crowd disease. Uh, and so it, it's, again, Lou talks about devil's bargains. I mean, these are, these are just extraordinarily complicated issues when you have to start to think about what the trade-offs are, uh, whether or not you're going to, to limit markets, whether or not you're going to limit commercial advance so that you can protect against something or at least try to protect against something like an outbreak uh, of influenza or uh, in the case of stuff that I've studied in the past, yellow fever, other epidemics. And, and it, it's, it's, just, it, it's just not, there's no simple answer. Uh, the the soundbite sounds nice. It's a good place to start, but then you have to actually start to answer the questions that that soundbite raises. It seems as though we're talking a little doom and gloom here, and I'm wondering, <laughs> are we doing anything right with the environment? Oh, sure. I, those are the things that are also those are things that are perhaps easiest to overlook. Uh, over most, uh, over much of California, I have to say. Uh, the, the numbers will show you that air quality has improved actually since the 1970s. Uh, I, I find it an astonishing statistic, one that I read a couple of weeks ago that I didn't know. Uh, that California today uses less water than it did in 1975, and, and which given all the growth in population since 1975 and the growth of the economy is really a remarkable thing. But isn't that because there's less ag land in use? Uh, well, no, I don't, I don't think that's necessarily uh, the, the main reason. I think there, there are lots of reasons for why we're able to do, we're able to live better on less um, quite often. I, I think there, there are other examples too. I, we used to see in this, in this area of the Central Valley a great deal of burning of rice fields. And you don't see that anymore. Uh, there were lots of concerns about how burning rice fields impacted air quality. And so one of the solutions to the problem of how to get rid of the stubble on the rice field was to flood them uh, and then to, to encourage and to help the stubble biodegrade faster. And this has actually created quite a remarkable habitat for a lot of species of waterfowl. So that uh, in, for some of these species, in fact, the flooded rice fields have become the best waterfowl habitat in the area. And, and that's, uh, that, that's not condemning that with faint praise. I, I mean that they're actually doing quite well off of that seasonal habitat. Um, we can, we, we tend not to think as a society, that nature and the city can exist together. I think that, that is one of our fundamental, one of fundamental failings because nature and the city have to exist together in terms of, of flood prevention and epidemic prevention and, and, and in terms of, of wildlife uh, maintenance and management as well. Uh, how we integrate 
our cities with our nature, with the nature around us, uh, is one of the fundamental questions that, that we face. You both well know this quote by George Santayana, that those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. What are you telling your students in your environmental history courses, things that they don't or will not forget? If, if you mean things that it, it could, uh, I'm always worried they're going to forget everything that I'm telling them, and they're trying not to because there's an exam coming up. But uh, the way it works quite often is when you leave the class, right, uh, as a student, when you leave the classroom. In my experience as a student, you did forget the facts that you were told quite often, the figures, the numbers. Uh, and what I'm always trying to, to give people in my classes is, a, is to help them learn a new way of thinking. Uh, because you don't forget that. That, I think, is, is what stays with you. And when you start to think historically about how the world around us got made, who made it, and, and how has the reshaping of nature led to uh, the world around us from this table, which is derived from natural resources from I, I don't know where, but imagine there's lots of oil and wood that's gone into it, um, to the air around us and, and what has gone into the air. Um, the, what, Ari just said about the way that uh, it's a mixed bag is, is absolutely true. Um, on the other hand, when you look, when you look to the past um, it, and we look at the problems that have been overcome, it's, it's pretty astonishing. Um, and, and a great example, he's, he's, Ari has written some excellent things about yellow fever uh, in New Orleans. There was a time in the 19th century, and, and I'll ask him to, to confirm this for me, that, that when, when people uh, looking at the crisis of disease in the cities, in particular cholera, which one was, the, was one of the great killers of the 19th century, uh, and they didn't know what was causing it, there were people who said, you know, the city may have reached its limits in terms of how useful it can be to us. Maybe American cities, uh, Philadelphia in 18, 1849, maybe that's about as big as it should get. And it won't get any bigger because it, it won't be able to because disease is going to keep hammering us and killing all these people. Uh, and and I, that turned out not to be true because people were able to learn about what created cholera and the historical conditions that led up to those epidemics and to change them. And often these things look like they're impossible to solve. And, and I'm, I'm not pessimistic about those kinds of things. I'm laughing because Louie and I uh, work down the hall uh, from each other. And, and, and uh, normally, I'm, I tend to be the more optimistic. But today, I find myself uh, uh, w with these predictions of gloom. I, I, I think that we've learned an extraordinary amount. And I think that, unfortunately, we haven't taken a lot of lessons to heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, I try and talk to students, uh, as Louis says, uh, about different ways about thinking about the past. And, and uh, I, I'm less interested in having them come out of my class class with, uh, with any particular facts or mm -hmm. set of figures that I am about uh, honing their analytical uh, uh, faculties. And, and that said, I mean, in, 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 in the climate in which we've been teaching about environmental history in the past year, it's very hard not to talk about disasters. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been a particularly disastrous year, and, or few years, really. Uh, and so I, I, I try and talk to students at great length about the notion that there's no such thing as a natural disaster, uh, mm -hmm. that disasters are much more complicated than that, and that you can't, you can't simply slough off responsibility and say that, uh, what are you going to do? Mother Nature's unpredictable. Uh, th this disaster couldn't have been prevented. That, in fact, there's, there are uh, networks of responsibility, and there are all sorts of causal loops that, that can be untangled over time to really understand the roots of most disasters. Uh, uh, and that most disasters at, at, at some level are, if not preventable, uh, you can contain them. Uh, and, and, and so if students come out of the class with the, with the tools to be able to think about the past and to be able to, to really untangle uh, some of these uh, catastrophic events, whether it's, it's cholera epidemics, yellow fever epidemics, or floods, or, or, or the great San Francisco earthquake, uh, and, and really understand the, the, the very dynamic uh, nature of the interaction between people and the environment, uh, then, then I feel like I've, I've done at least part of my job. Well, you certainly have done your part of your job here because I am fascinated 
fascinated with environmental history. I want to thank you both for coming on Frontiers. There's so much more we could ask, but we're out of time. Thanks thank you very much. And thanks to all of you who joined us for today's discussion. You can learn more about this subject by visiting our website at frontiers.ucdavis.edu. In the summer of 2005, Hurricane Katrina left Gulf Coast residents desperately seeking life's necessities. Two different stories emerged in the media based on skin color. For example, an African American who was photographed pulling a plastic bag through the water was reportedly looting a grocery store. In another photo, the caption pointed out that two white residents were simply wading through chest deep water after finding bread and soda from a local grocery store. Indeed, throughout our nation's history, the stories that African Americans have told about themselves have been very different than those told about them. Our guest today on Frontiers is Pat Turner, a UC Davis professor of African American Studies, who looks at storytelling, the tales that African Americans tell about themselves and those told about them. In the past year, Professor Turner has been focusing on rumors and legends generated by Hurricane Katrina. She has, in fact, been providing background for a play about Katrina. And she went to New Orleans for the August 29th hurricane anniversary and gave guest lectures on Katrina lore for college students who are reading her books on rumor and race in America. Professor Turner, welcome to Frontiers. It's nice to be here, Paul. The first question I wanted to ask you is, what is the difference between folklore and urban legends? Well, an urban legend is a kind of folklore. If you think of folklore as a broad category, it includes folk music, proverbs, riddles, jokes, folk tales, urban legends. And urban legends are narratives that are told as true, but without a standard of documentation within them. So what are some of the rumors you've been uncovering since Hurricane Katrina? There's a lot of very familiar rumors um, circulating in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. Within the African American community, the most tenacious one focuses on the levees and the belief that they were intentionally breached, that they were dynamited. In some versions, you'll hear that they were dynamited in order to save the white communities, to flood the Lower Ninth Ward in order to keep the white neighborhoods secure. In the more um, pernicious versions, it was an intentional mechanism of genocide, the hope that the floodwaters would actually kill African Americans. Now, after a year, that rumor is still circulating? It's probably the most well-known of the texts within the black community. And it's actually interesting, Paul, because it sort of surfaced before the hurricane struck. On the eve of the hurricane, when people began to realize that this powerful storm was coming through, um, um, I'm told that the communication went that um, if the hurricane strikes, when it strikes, they're getting ready so they can bomb the levees and flood us out, just like they did before. And the same rumor circulated in 1965, after Hurricane Betsy. But in 1927, after the Great Mississippi Flood, the, the levees were intentionally breached. It really did happen. And that's a very familiar pattern to those of us who understand rumors and urban legends. There's often a framework of truth that um, surrounds the text that surfaces. Now, we have absolutely no evidence to suggest that the levees were breached in 2005, intentionally were breached in 2005, but there's enough truth in terms of the ways in which blacks in New Orleans have been treated throughout the 20th and the 21st century to make that plausible to African Americans. Are the rumors distinctly different what blacks tell about whites? Absolutely. Um, in the, the text that, that blacks tell about whites, the whites are, are the powerful, they're the, the conspirators, uh, the racist, and so forth. In the texts that have circulated in the white community, the blacks have been very much demonized, and they're depicted as animalistic. So the texts that have circulated in the white community about blacks sort of fall into a category of ungrateful victims 
victims, um, um, that the evacuees did not appreciate the largesse that was shown to them in the aftermath of the hurricane. So there are texts about busloads of Katrina evacuees destroying rest stops on their way to Texas, um, being very, very rude and belligerent in the Astrodome, throwing food back at the people who were giving them food, um, texts that say that when buses came to take evacuees to job fairs, no one lined up, no one wanted to go get a job. Uh, so, so the, and the language that comes up in these things are vile, venomous, animalistic. These are words that come out of these urban legends and rumors. Does the news media promote rumors? I don't think it does intentionally, but certainly in the case of Hurricane Katrina, the, the need to get um, news to the American public as quickly as possible had lots of reporters not doing the kind of fact-checking that they would normally like to be able to do. So one of the texts that was widely reported uh, in the aftermath of the hurricane right in the first few hours was that the helicopters who had gone in to effect rescues were shot at. And that was reported in the newspapers, it was reported on television, it was reported on radio, but in point of fact, the post-Katrina investigations have find no evidence of, of gangs shooting at helicopters. Pat, what's the practical aspects of studying folklore as an academic pursuit? I think that there are many practical aspects of studying folklore. It's one of the vehicles that gets us to the experience of, of, of everyday life and, and everyday people. M much of academic study sort of focuses on the elite and those in power and the, the texts that they generate, their letters, their documents, and so forth. But the working class often don't leave behind a library of letters. They don't have the kinds of, of journals that those in powers would have, the diaries and so forth. So folklore, studying their music, studying their stories, studying the, their urban legends, gets you to an understanding of their culture. I want to add, however, that the elite have folklore as well. That's one of the common misconceptions, that folklore is somehow or another about rural, unschooled people, that, that, that they have folklore, and people with PhDs don't have folklore. People with PhDs have folklore. What impact does the internet have on rumor urban legends folklore? It has an enormous impact because it's so easy to forward something. It's so easy when you get a text to just send it on. Um, I found people who think that urban legends didn't exist before the internet, and that's certainly not the case. But using the Katrina example, a lot of these texts that have to do with um, the alleged destruction of rest stops and the belligerence at the Astrodome are in the form of long stories that one person creates and then sends to everyone that they've got an email address for, and then those people read it and send it on. And so it really flourishes in cyberspace. Briefly, social tensions, do they underlie all rumors and urban legends? I think social tensions almost always do. Some, some, something that's uneasy. Um, something that's difficult for people to speak about. Um, an, a narrative, an urban legend crystallizes that and gives you a, a really specific story to latch on to, to prove your point that your people are superior to another people or this individual is stronger than that individual or this celebrity is not as, as uh, attractive an individual as the publicist would have us believe. Pat, this is a fascinating topic. I wish we had more time, but we're out of time. Thank you for appearing on Frontiers. Thank you. And thanks to all of you who joined us for today's discussion. You can learn more about this subject by visiting our website at frontiers.ucdavis.edu.